Welcome back to another engaging lesson focused on electrocardiographic tracings. In this session, we will dive into a discussion about various electrocardiogram patterns. Although it is important to remember that clinical diagnosis usually relies on a broader range of factors, our focus today will be specifically on the tracings and the diagnostic process based on ECG data. In the following analysis of five distinct ECG, we will examine critical situations faced by four different patients. Our goal is to identify these potential clinical scenarios based solely on the electrocardiographic tracings. The first electrocardiogram we will examine is displayed on the screen, featuring a 60-year-old male patient. I suggest pausing the video to carefully analyze the ECG before I begin discussing it in detail. Upon examining this particular ECG, we can clearly observe a significant widening of the PR interval accompanied by a sinus rhythm. Additionally, there is an extremely widened QRS complex that does not correspond to any specific conduction disturbance, such as left or right bundle branch block. This widened QRS complex is also associated with a sharply peaked T wave. These findings suggest a potential case of severe hyperkalemia. Among the various causes of QRS prolongation, some of the most common include delays in ventricular conduction, such as left or right bundle branch blocks, or other conduction disturbances. Extrinsic causes can also play a role, such as hyperkalemia, which was demonstrated in the previous ECG example. The use of class 1 antiarrhythmic drugs like flecainide, propafenone, quinidine, and procainamide may contribute as well. Furthermore, the use or intoxication of tricyclic antidepressants especially when combined with certain phenethazines like chlorpromazine can lead to QRS prolongation. Ventricular rhythms, either due to intrinsic factors or triggered by ventricular pacing, can also cause widened QRS complexes. Finally, ventricular preexcitation observed in cases with an accessory atrioventricular pathway, such as in Wolf-Parkinson-White WPW syndrome, can result in QRS prolongation. The second electrocardiogram features a 50-year-old male patient. I suggest pausing the video to carefully analyze the ECG before I begin discussing it in detail. What immediately stands out in this ECG is the significant ST segment elevation in the lateral leads D1 and a VL, as well as throughout the anterior leads from V1 to V6. In addition, we can see a ST segment depression in the inferior leads, particularly D3 and AVF. Alongside this, we can observe the early stages of a Q wave, which becomes more visible in leads V4 to V6. These findings lead us to diagnose the hyperacute phase of an extensive anterior acute myocardial infarction. We can clearly see that the Q wave, indicative of areas of necrosis, is beginning to form, accompanied by extremely elevated ST segments and a mirrored image in the inferior wall. Remember that not only can an acute myocardial infarction cause a ST segment elevation, but there are also other causes. Among them, we can find prinzmetal angina, which is a vasospastic angina. This means the patient is not experiencing an infarction but still has transmural myocardial ischemia, which also leads to ST segment elevation in the affected territory. Patients who have had a previous acute myocardial infarction, usually extensive anterior infarctions, and who progress or may progress to left ventricular aneurysm, can maintain a ST segment elevation even after the acute phase of the infarction. This can also be a confounding factor in patients with acute myocardial infarction. Patients with acute pericarditis may also experience a ST segment elevation. In patients with ST segment elevation due to acute pericarditis, it is important to note that you typically do not see isolated ST segment elevation in one wall, but rather diffuse elevation across all leads, potentially accompanied by PR segment depression. Chest pain in these cases is usually ventilatory in nature, associated with other symptoms and slightly different from the pain of an acute myocardial infarction. Asymptomatic patients, or those with symptoms but with early repolarization as the only finding are also important to consider. Early repolarization is common in young patients, particularly African Americans, and is another cause of a ST segment elevation that should be remembered during electrocardiographic analysis. Patients with left ventricular hypertrophy or conduction disorders, such as left and right bundle branch block, may also have ST segment alterations. 
patients who have had or are in the acute phase of myocarditis may also exhibit ST segment changes, and this should be remembered as a differential diagnosis. Left ventricular trauma should also be considered as a cause of ST segment changes, as well as Osborne waves observed in patients with hypothermia. Lastly, patients with hyperkalemia may present with ST segment elevation, which is typically restricted to leads V1 and V2. This new tracing is from a 68-year-old male patient. I recommend pausing the video to thoroughly examine the ECG before I start discussing its details. The tracing in question shows a tachycardic rhythm with a wide QRS complex. We cannot visualize P waves, and it initially appears to be a regular rhythm. Here, our goal is to differentiate between a supraventricular tachycardia conducted with aberrancy or a ventricular tachycardia. In this case, we can clearly observe that the QRS complex has a regular rhythm with a right bundle branch block morphology. We cannot see any dissociated P waves associated with the QRS complex, which in itself would favor ventricular tachycardia, nor can we visualize any fusion complexes, which would also favor ventricular tachycardia. However, we note that the QRS complex has a right bundle branch block morphology with a duration exceeding 140 milliseconds, which supports ventricular tachycardia. Additionally, in lead V1 with a right bundle branch block morphology, we have a pure R wave, which also favors ventricular tachycardia and an axis deviated to the upper right portion. This extreme QRS axis deviation also supports ventricular tachycardia. We have here the diagnosis of a monomorphic ventricular tachycardia, as all QRS complexes have the same morphology and are sustained. Remember that the definition of sustained ventricular tachycardia is either one with hemodynamic instability or one without hemodynamic instability that lasts at least 30 seconds. Keep in mind that the criteria favoring ventricular tachycardia when faced with an electrocardiogram with a wide QRS complex include the presence of atrioventricular dissociation, which was not visible in the previous electrocardiogram. The duration of the QRS complexes is also a factor, with a right bundle branch block morphology, as seen in the previous electrocardiogram, where the QRS complex lasts longer than 140 milliseconds or 0.14 seconds. Another consideration is when we have an electrocardiogram with a left bundle branch block pattern and the QRS complex has a duration greater than 160 milliseconds. Also, based on the QRS complex shapes in the precordial leads, ventricular tachycardia is favored when we have an electrocardiogram with a right bundle branch block pattern that does not maintain the classic RSR pattern or a patient with a left bundle branch block pattern. In the case of a left bundle branch block pattern, Ventricular tachycardia is favored when the duration of R in leads V1 or V2 exceeds 40 milliseconds or 0.04 seconds. Another factor is when we have a left bundle branch block pattern where in lead V6, we observe a QR complex, deviating from the classic left bundle branch block pattern. In this following ECG, we have another potentially serious cause that we will attempt to analyze based on the electrocardiographic tracing of a 75-year-old woman. I recommend pausing the video to thoroughly examine the ECG before I start discussing its details. In this tracing, we can clearly observe the presence of multiple P waves, maintaining a completely different frequency from the QRS complexes. Moreover, these QRS complexes are relatively wide, meaning they are greater than 120 milliseconds. We can also notice that there is no relationship between the atrial beats represented by the P waves and the ventricular beats represented by the QRS complexes. At times, we can even see that the P waves enter and exit the QRS complexes. This configuration establishes the diagnosis of a sinus or atrial rhythm associated with a complete atrioventricular block or a third-degree atrioventricular block with ventricular escape rhythm. Initially, we may even consider it to be a slow escape rhythm since we have a widened QRS complex. Take a look at this electrocardiogram. What is your opinion on it? What potentially severe and fatal etiologies could generate this type of alteration? Don't miss the answer in our next class on real ECG clinical case studies. Subscribe so you don't miss out. Thank you for taking the time to learn with us today.
Please share this video with your colleagues, subscribe to our channel, and give us a positive evaluation. We hope to see you soon in our next video.